All right, welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us today for this lunchtime webinar, Bumblebee Identification for Bumblebee Atlas Volunteers. Today is gonna to be all about BID. We're gonna be walking you through how to identify bees to species via photographs that you submit in Bumblebee Watch. Um, just a couple of quick housekeeping things before we get started. Um, first off, this webinar is going to be recorded. And so if we're talking, um, through a species and, you know, you can't quite remember what we said, this video is going to be posted to YouTube, um, so you can go back and re-listen to it if you would like to do that. <clears throat> um, if you have any questions for any of the panelists, please post that question to the Q&A, uh, as opposed to posting your question to the chat. Um, this makes it easier for us to moderate your questions and to make sure we're answering everybody's questions quickly. And we can also type in the answers there so other people can view them. Um, if you see a question in the Q&A that you really like, you can also upvote it, and that will bring that question to the top of the Q&A. Lastly, we are going to ask you guys to complete a survey after this webinar is complete. So once you log out, a survey link will pop up. Um, if you have time, we would love it if you could fill out that survey. We love your feedback and your input for when we're putting together these presentations. And so we would really appreciate it if you could fill that out. We would also like to introduce ourselves to you all. Um, my name is Genevieve Pajesic. I am a conservation biologist with the Xerces Society. Uh, I am also one of the coordinators of the Bumblebee Atlas in the Midwestern United States, and I'm based in Minnesota. Katie, I'll popcorn to you. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Katie Lanky. <laughs> I'm seeing some familiar names on here. It's good to see you all here. Um, I am a conservation biologist for the Xerces Society as well, based in Lincoln, Nebraska, and work with all the lovely folks on this call to coordinate Great Plains, Midwest, Nebraska, Missouri, and soon Iowa. So thanks for being here today. Elaine, I'll go to you next. Hi, I'm Elaine Evans. I'm an extension educator and researcher at the University of Minnesota and have been involved with the Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas since 2015 and was doing bumblebee surveys in the Twin Cities since 2007. So been in the game for a while and um, happy to uh, to be collaborating with Circes and part of this Midwest Bumblebee Atlas. And I will let Elise go. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Elise Bernstein. Um, I'm an outreach specialist and researcher with the Bee Squad out of the Bee Lab at the University of Minnesota. Um, so I do a lot of outreach and education work across the Twin Cities and help Elena with some bumblebee research. Um, and I help to coordinate the Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. <clears throat> um, so before we jump into Bumblebee ID, I'm just going to provide a brief overview of Bumblebee Watch to orient you to our platform where we collect observations from Atlas volunteers. So I'm going to share my screen with you all. All right. So I'm guessing most of the folks in the audience are Bumblebee Atlas participants. So you're probably already familiar with the Bumblebee Watch website. But for those of you who are new or who haven't submitted an observation to the website yet, uh, Bumblebee Watch is the online platform where we collect observations from participants um, when they go out in the field and conduct a survey. Um, and today we're going to be showcasing observations collected by participants as we walk you through our IDs. Um, <clears throat> When you go to Bumblebee Watch, some of the features of the website are only available to you once you log in. And one of those features, as I mentioned, is the ability to record your sightings. So if you're logged in and you have a sighting that you want to record, you can go to this tab called Record a Sighting. Um, and you can submit a sighting of a bumblebee. So you can submit an incidental observation of a bumblebee that you see on a flower and that you take a picture of, or you can submit your data that you collected for your Atlas survey. And you can also submit nest sightings. So if you run into a nest 
um, in your backyard or when you're doing a survey, you can submit a photo of that nest to the to the nest sighting link. Um, there are lots of ways that you can interact with the data that is collected by Bumblebee Atlas participants. You can go to the map tab if you want to view maps of different species. Looks like Google is having some update go situation going on, but you can still see here um, the data that has been collected by that has been collected by participants um, in this map, and this is for. Um, you know, species all over the United States. I haven't filled in any of these categories here, um, but if I wanted to look at observations for Bombus affinis and hit search, it will bring up just observations of that one species. Um, and you can also interact with the data by looking at specific observations. So if you go to explore data and B list, you can check out observations for a specific project. And I'm gonna show you some observations that I collected for the Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas. So I can just go to search and that will bring up my observations for this specific project. Um, if I click on one of those, it will bring up that observation. And so this is what we're gonna be showing you today. Uh, specific observations which come with a set of photos of one single bumblebee, as well as the geographic location for where that bee was located. Every single one of these observations that's submitted to Bumblebee Watch is verified by an expert. Um, because I have expert status in Bumblebee Watch, I can verify this observation as the bee that I think it is. So if I go to verify here, it will bring up a series of questions. Um, the first category that I can fill out is the status of the bee. So if I wanted to verify this bee, I could switch this status to verified. Um, every time that a bee is uploaded to Bumblebee Watch, it is automatically registered as pending because we want an expert to come and look at that. Um, there are a couple other categories here, invalid, um, and tentative. So if I am not sure that this bee is actually the species that I think it is, I will mark it as tentative. So then I can ask another expert about that specific bee because I might want another person's opinion on it. Uh, and then we also have a category for invalid observations. So if I encounter a duplicate observation in the data set, um, and I'm not sure if that actually represents a separate B, then I, I would mark it as invalid. And so when you get emails from Bumblebee Watch, if you've submitted observations and they let you know, you know, your observation has been verified or it's been marked as tentative, that's what that means. Um, you know, if it's been verified, then we're sure that that's what that species is. Um, and if it's tentative, then, you know, we might need a little bit more information there. Um, I collected this bee, and so I'm pretty sure it's a vegans, but if I wanted to switch what species it was, I could go to the species list. Uh, and this is just, is just a list of all the species that are present in that geographic location where I collected the bee. There are also two categories here at the bottom that aren't specific species. The first one is bumblebee species. Um, and so this is just a category that I would use if I couldn't tell from the photographs what specific species it was. You know, sometimes we encounter an observation where, you know, no matter what, we just can't tell what bee species it is. Maybe the hairs are really worn down and the bee is really old. And so we can't get a good sense of what the color patterns are from that photograph. Um, or sometimes the photos are um, the, based on the lighting or the angles, we just can't see some of those key features that we need to separate two bees from each other. So if you have a observation that's been marked as bumblebee species, it's just because we can't be 100% certain what species of bee that is. 
Um, and then there's also this category unknown or not a bumblebee. And so that's a category that we use if somebody submits an observation of an insect that's not a bumblebee. So carpenter bee, a kind of solitary bee, just something that, you know, isn't a bumblebee, even though it looks like it. Um, I can also change the, I can mark whether or not the bee is male or female, a queen of worker, or if I can't tell what sex the bee is. Uh, and then the last two categories here are the determiner notes and then the comments. So determiner notes are just things that I want to put in the data. Like if I can't, if I'm not 100% certain that this is a Bombus vagans, uh, I can make a note here. I think that this could be Bombus vagans or another species of bee. Uh, and then the comments are uh, comments that are publicly available that you can see. So if I write a comment here, it will pop up in the very bottom of the notes uh, or of the page for this bumblebee. Um, and you'll also get an email if, you, if you're if you the observer that somebody left a comment and so you can go and read it. Um, sometimes we give you, usually we just say thank you for your observation because we're so appreciative of your efforts to collect these observations. But you know, sometimes we'll leave tips for photography or we'll let you know if we think it could be one of two different bees or something like that. So if you get a comment from us, you know, please check them out. Sometimes they have relevant information in there for you. And it's one of the ways that we can communicate with you guys directly when we are verifying these observations. Okay, and I think that wraps up my intro to Bumblebee Watch. Elaine, do you want to take it from here? Sure. Awesome. All right, looks like I'm sharing the right thing. <laughs> um, so I wanted to start out with just a, a brief overview of some suggested photos we have for the um, for groups of bees. So, um, and I'll just, I see a question there if the bees are killed in order to verify them. Um, if we just chill the bees for photographing them so they, they might look dead. But um, if you just put the bee on ice for a few minutes, it slows them down and then you're able to get these close up photos and they, they recover quickly and, and fly off, sometimes too quickly if you don't cool them enough. <laughs> so, um, but it, it's a handy trick with, with cold blooded beings that you can just chill them down to get them to sit still for photos. So um, there are, you know, typical photos that that people take that we recommend people take. So in general, we recommend people get photos of the kind of the top side of the bee so we can see the thorax and the abdomen color patterns from the top, the side of the bee so we can see color patterns on the side of the thorax mostly, and then also the front of the face because there's structures there to see. But it can help to hone in a little bit more if you know um, kind of the group of bees that you're looking at. There are photos that can can be especially useful for separating bees within those groups. So I was just gonna give a brief overview and then some specifics on one of the more challenging groups for us verifying. For the Midwest, there are three species that we just call the big three. They make up um, about 80% of, of observations usually, of very abundant bees. So um, the common Eastern impatiens, two spotted by Maculatus and the brown belted Griseocolis. And um, for, for them to be able to, to tell them apart, the most important things for us to see are the first two segments of the abdomen and also being able to see the top of their head. So um, you know, we still recommend that kind of the general array of top side face, but if you can make sure that um, we can really see what's going on on those first two segments of the abdomen, especially that's super um, helpful for that group. There's another group of bumblebees that we call the very yellow bumblebees. So these are bees that um, really have a lot more yellow on them. So they have yellow extending down most of their abdomen. And there's um, two main species here that we try to tell apart. And for them, um, it's really important for us to see their, the front of their face, to see hairs that they have there, and then to also see some differences with, with what's happening on the sides of their thorax. And um, 
There's one other tricky bee when you're looking at the males that can kind of get in there. Um, so there's another species, Perplexus um, and Pennsylvanicus, that can show up um, with some hair patterns that show up there. So if you have a bee that has a lot of yellow on it, um, especially if it's a male, getting a picture of the very tip of the abdomen that's in focus can help us out a lot. Otherwise, getting those usual kind of front of the face, side of the thorax, top of the thorax are, are ones that are really helpful for that group. Um, I just wanted to mention rusty patch bumblebee here too, because, um, because that is just a species of, of particular interest for a lot of folks. And there, um, again, those, the first, like the, we did for the um, big three, those first two segments of the abdomens are, abdomen are ones that um, we really need to see. Those can be a little bit trickier if the bees have their, their wings folded up over, over the back of their, of their um, you know, covering their thorax. Um, so just being conscious if you see something that looks like it might be rusty patch to try to make sure you can get good photos of those first two segments of the abdomen. Then um, the other typical things with getting the thorax, the front of the face are really helpful for that group. Then we have um, a bunch of different species that we call the red bumblebees. These are bees that typically have some red color on them, more so than the, the rusty patch has kind of a rusty patch, and these will have more like bright orange or red um, hairs. And there are some that can be really tricky. So um, the red belted bumblebee is one that has a lot of different color patterns. Um, but again, it's kind of a repeating theme here where those first two segments of the abdomen are really helpful for us to distinguish these different species from each other as well as um, just the the top of of the thorax another group um, of of bumblebees are ones that have a lot of black on on their um on their thorax and also on the the first segment of their abdomen so um, these we call the T1 black bumblebees. A lot of the other bees we've been talking about before will have mostly yellow on that first segment of the abdomen. So T1 here is standing for um, the first segment. It's a tergite is what T stands for. That's just the first segment of the abdomen. So sorry for the, sorry for the jargon. Um, but these, there are a couple species here that are really tricky, um, but, um, looking at some other characters, um, looking, having a good view of what's going on on the top of the head, what's going on with, um, actually, if you can get details to be able to see what's going on with the uh, with their eyes here and wh where they're at kind of on their head, those kind of details can help us. So those acelli are these three simple eyes that the bees have on top of their head. So if you have one of those bees that have um, a lot of black on their first abdominal segment, recurring theme, first two segments of the abdomen, also the top of the head, seeing if you can get a shot where those um, ocelli, those simple eyes are in focus helps. And then this is another one where it can help to see what's happening at that very tip of the abdomen as well. Um, I also just wanted to mention quickly um, parasites. So there are cuckoo bumblebees that you'll see out there. I know Jenny's going to talk more about um, one of our ones that we see more out there, but just in general, these can be a little tricky. They don't have, um, the females don't have the big pollen baskets like everyone else. Um, and, and these in general can be tricky, but, um, but they do have the, the, these really distinct kind of bigger, thicker heads, which is something after you look at bumblebees for a long time, that can can start to stick out. Um, a lot of times they have darker hair, kind of less hair on their abdomen. But for these, um, oh, sorry, I'm not sure why that, that is getting cut off like that. Um, but for these the really important things, shots to get for the cuckoo bumblebees are the kind of end of the abdomen. And if you have um, what looks like a male, getting a clear shot of the antenna. So that this is where the chilling the bees to slow them down is, is really important um, if you're gonna try to get something in focus um, like those, those tiny features. 
this is the last section I'm going to talk about, and then this is the one I'm going to get into details of, and then um, other other panelists will get into details with other bees. But I wanted to just give kind of an overview of the most of kind of the big groups of bees and some differences within those groups. So um, I am going to talk about the um, confusing T1 and T2 yellow bumblebees. So we have a good number of species that have their first two abdominal segments are all yellow, and then they're, they can be very difficult to tell apart other than that. Um, so the, um, two of these are um, Vegans and Sandersoni, and I'll um, get into detail here, but, um, but the shot we need is being able to really clearly see this um, this part it's called the malar space. I also sometimes just call it a cheek. So it's the space between their eye and where their mandible starts. And um, they both have so so bumblebees vary. Some some bees have really short cheeks. Some have long cheeks. These both are kind of long, but vegans is longer. So. Um, so it's it's not a huge difference, but it's a difference here between the the length and the width. Where for Sandersoni, it's a bit more square. Um, coloration is less reliable, so there sometimes are some coloration differences. But really, we pretty much need to look at that um, that finer detail with the cheek to tell these apart. And that's just for the females. It doesn't work for the males. For males, we the feature we can use to tell these two species apart are the um, are the antennae. So again, same kind of um, pattern here. We're on this third antennal segment. Vegans is is long, and Sandersoni is less long. <laughs> Um, and then Sandersoni also has these hairs on the underside of the abdomen. That's harder to get in, in photos out in the field, but it is possible for people to take photos that show these the, the and difference, differences with the antennal segments. And I'll, I'll show you some examples of that. Um, so these bees are often grouped together at the, the level of the subgenus. So bumblebees all belong to the genus Bombus. And then there are um, different subgenera that that of bees that are more closely related. And so um, Vegans and Sandersoni are both in in the genus subgenus Pyrobombus. So sometimes they just get grouped there. Jenny, when she was showing that verification, showed you that there was a group for um, for 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 that that included the half black and Sanderson's and also um, Bombus perplexus, the perplexing bumblebee. So this is a diff difficult enough group that we have just as verifiers, we have a section where we can just put them all together when we can't tell them apart. So for these, we need that again, top of the thorax. It's great if we can get the side of the face or just a clear shot where we can see that cheek area to really tell how long it is. Um, and then if you have a male, if you can get the antennae in focus, um, that really helps. So here's where the problem is with this group is that um, currently in Bumblebee Watch, we have 999 observations that are in there as two striped group. One of the things that we love about the data that we have in Bumblebee Watch is we're able to make um, really good conservation recommendations and a lot of times those are best done at the species level it does help to have these kind of data that are in a broader group but when we can get to a species level um, it can make a big difference and we're lucky that as far as we know right now none of these of the three species i've been talking about are of conservation concern they, they seem to be fairly stable but if one of these species was became um if if we were able to document declines if a problem comes up with this group we want to be able to tell them apart from each other so um so one of the things that can help is where they are understanding where they are so um for vegans they're found kind of throughout the northern part of, of north america um and down down south through the midwest so if you're anywhere in the midwest you have a good chance of seeing vegans and a bee to watch out for. 
for Sandersoni, they are really only in the, the northern parts of the states. So in, in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, um, in the northern parts of those states, that's where you'll be running into Sandersoni and where we need to be more careful about getting those, those photos to be able to, to tell them apart. Um, so, so once again, reminder of these features to tell them apart, looking at that mailer space. And then um, I just pulled up a couple photos here to show you photos um, where we're able to, to tell who they are. So, so one of the things is that geographic range. So, so this one is kind of right on the edge. If you remember that map for Sandersoni, they kind of come down here. If this was in Southern Minnesota, I'd be more sure that it's not Sandersoni. But since it's here, I need to look up close to tell if it is Vegans or Sandersoni. And so um, when I'm able to zoom in on this picture, even though it's not a totally, you know, the antennae is going over here, it's not a super, you know, detailed, in focused, perfectly lit photo, but I can still see what's going on there. I can see from the, the, end of the, the where the eye is down to the mandible and I can look at that length. Um, I can see what this width is and so I can see that's a long mailer space. So that's an example of a photo where I can see what's going on. Here's another photo that's kind of in that range where it could be either either one or the other. This I can see more clearly. I can see the whole mailer space there once um, once I zoom in on it and I can, can get kind of a measurement and see relative measurement of the length to the width. I can see that this is also a long mailer space. So here's one way up north, definitely possible to be either Sandersoni or Vegans. And when I zoom in on this one, this one you can really see even from here. You can already see that um, that that mailer space is shorter. So then I can confidently say that this is Bombus sandersoni. A little so with the males again. These um, we can't use that that mailer space. We can't use that cheek. We need to um, know what's going on with their antennae. And so um, here's another example of a vegans that is kind of close to the edge of the range where Sandersoni could show up. Um, but I am able to, to zoom in and clearly see what's going on with the antennae here, can look at the length versus the width and see that that is, is long. Here's um, way up north in Minnesota. Um, this is another male where the um, photo, I'm able to zoom in, able to see, um, Oh, somehow I lost the photo, but still have the measurement. <laughs> but I was able to do a measurement. Um, if you picture here, um, able to, to see the length of that and see that it is um, it is shorter. I kind of pasted both of these over to kind of compare. It's close, but you can see that length to width is um, has more length in in vegans for those antennae. I'm just going to throw one more um, thing in here, and that is perplexus, which is um, also has uh, it's pretty variable with color. But again, another one that's going to be of concern mostly in the northern part of the Midwest, and um, that one does also have those. The first two segments are are yellow on the abdomen. Um, but I was going to try. Um, let's see. Oops, I have to sign in here bring you actually as is the and did it is it showing the tab I want it to my I bumblebee see, watch tab I see a bumblebee watch tab with Bombus perplexus yes <laughs> that's what I wanted to show okay. uh yeah so this is a Bombus perplexus um from um that is from northern Minnesota and um, I just want to quickly show the, the differences. What we need to look at here um, is that, um, let's see, is this going to take a big one? So Bombus perplexus is similar, but it has black on the side of the thorax, and it has a lot more um, yellow on the, the top of the thorax. So it actually has yellow that goes through the thorax, um, across the whole thorax. 
So, so this is one that shows up, but it, it, it can get lumped in with those other ones. But as long as you get those kind of standard photos with the top of the thorax, side of the thorax, we can see, um, pretty easily see what's going on to pick those apart. And that is it for me. <laughs> Hopefully I didn't go too long. <laughs> All right. All right, I am up next. So we're gonna talk a little bit about um, the big three. So those three most common Minnesota species, um, look at some observations and talk about how we know uh, what species they are. So first we have Bombus impatiens, which is the common Eastern bumblebee. Um, this observation was sort of from central Minnesota, uh, but this species is very common, more common in the southern half of Minnesota, um, but it is found um, throughout the Great Plains, the Midwest, and across the East Coast as well, um, and it is currently expanding in range. Uh, so it's a bee that we see a lot. There's a lot of observations on Bumblebee Watch that are the common eastern bumblebee. So if we're looking at this observation um, in particular from this first photo, we know that it's a bumblebee, but we can't necessarily determine what type of bumblebee. So we're looking for photos that show shots of those first two abdominal segments, um, and then something that shows the head and the face as well. Uh, so in this first photo here, uh, we can see the face. Uh, we see the yellow sort of on the thorax um, peeking out from behind the head, uh, but we're still not seeing those abdominal segments yet. Um, then we move into the next photo where we can pretty clearly see uh, both the thorax and the abdomen of this bee. Um, this bee is mostly yellow on her thorax. Uh, it looks like she's some of her hairs have been worn away, which happens to bumblebees a lot as they move throughout the season, um, which can make identifications a little bit more difficult when they're losing hairs um, in areas that we need to correctly identify them. Um, but for this bee, she's still got enough yellow hair on that uh, thorax um, that we sort of know what's going on there. And then we can see very clearly her first two abdominal segments. So we can see all the way across that first segment uh, is yellow, and then the rest of those abdominal segments are black. Again, in this next photo, we're still seeing um, that those segments pretty clearly. We're still seeing that yellow on the first one and then black on the rest of the abdominal segments. Um, another thing that's important to pay attention to when we're determining the sex of the bee um, is looking at what is going on on the legs. Uh, so female bumblebees have corbicula or pollen baskets uh, where they pack the pollen into their hind legs. So they can bring it back to their nests. Um, and this is something that is found only on female bumblebees, not on the males. Um, so we can see if we look at this image a little bit bigger, um, those hind legs are, they're very wide and they have um, lots of hair sticking out. Uh, you can see there's even little remnants of pollen that are left behind, uh, but the female bumblebees have a lot thicker, um, stronger, I guess, looking uh, hind legs. And then we can also see that there are no yellow hairs on her face. Um, some species of bumblebees, the males will have yellow hairs on their faces and the females will not. Um, Bombus impatiens is one of those species. So we're seeing no yellow hair on the face. And then we are seeing those pretty clearly defined pollen baskets, uh, which lets us know that this is a female. We've got here just one more observation of a Bombus impatiens female. Um, this is another really awesome photo where we can clearly see right from that first picture what's going on in the thorax. So again, lots of yellow hairs with some uh, black hairs kind of in the middle. And then we can clearly see all of the abdominal segments. The first segment being yellow running all the way across followed by black. Um, and then in the second photo, again, just from a different angle, we're seeing a similar thing uh, with yellow on the thorax. And then the first abdominal segment is yellow. Um, a dead giveaway that this is a female Bombus impatiens uh, is her pollen baskets. So uh, we're seeing this little bit of orange um, on her hind leg here. This is the pollen that she's packed into that pollen basket. 
like I said before, um, male bumblebees don't have pollen baskets. So we know right away when we're seeing bees that have these big globs of pollen on their legs that these are females. Um, then we'll just look at one male bombus impatiens quickly so you know what I'm talking about when we're looking at the legs and what's going on on the face. So from this first photo, um, we can't necessarily tell right off the bat if it's male or female, but we know it's a bombus impatiens because just that first abdominal segment is yellow. Um, we can see a little bit in, in this photo what's happening on those hind legs. So they're a little bit skinnier, um, maybe not as hairy because there is no pollen basket. Uh, but what we're also looking for is what is going on on the face. So this is a really good photo um, that shows what's happening on the face. This bee sort of has a little yellow mustache uh, that helps us know it's a male bee. Again, just more angles. All of these photos, you know, are showing different angles of the bee that are just helping us be more certain uh, in our identifications. Okay, so we will move on to the next species in the big three, which is Bombus bimaculatus or the two-spotted bumblebee. Um, again, since this is another big three species, um, it is very common um, here in Minnesota. It's more common in the southern half of the states, um, and it is seen across the eastern half of the U.S., so sort of the Midwest spanning over to the east coast. Um, Again, on this bee, uh, the thorax is mostly yellow with just some of those uh, sort of black hairs or like a central black dot of hairs um, in the middle. Um, and the difference that we're looking for between the common Eastern bumblebee or the Bombus impatiens and Bombus bimaculatus um, is what's going on on that second abdominal segment. So our first abdominal segment, again, is yellow all the way across, just like the Bombus impatiens. Um, but on our second segment, um, there's a little sort of two spots or sort of a W shape. Um, and from this first photo in this observation, we can just see a little bit of that poking out. Um, so there's just, we can tell there's a little bit of something going on on that second segment, um, but it's not exactly clear what it is. Um, this photo uh, shows the face. Um, so Bombus bimaculatus has a long malar space. So Elaine was talking about the malar space uh, with Fagans and Sandersoni. So that's something that we look at um, in all bumblebees. Um, but so they have a little bit of a longer face than the common Eastern bumblebees do. Um, this is a really good shot of what's going on on the thorax. So lots of yellow hairs, um, just a little bit of black in the middle. Um, and then going to our last photo, going back to what we were talking about originally with what's happening on that second abdominal segment. So we're seeing much more clearly in this photo uh, that there is those little sort of two dots or that little W shape um, uh, on this bee. And that indicates to us that this is a two-spotted bumblebee or Bombus bimaculatus. And those two spots are really sort of confined to the middle of her abdomen. Uh, so there's some black on the edges of those that span sort of to the edge of the segment. Um, and we know that this is a female. Um, we can see in this first photo her pollen baskets because she's got those thicker hind legs. And then from this photo, we're not seeing any yellow on her face. So if we want to take a look at a, another bee, we want to we should think about um, the Bombus bimaculatus males. And these males can be a little bit tricky sometimes. Um, so this photo, again, is doing a really good job of showing what's going on on the abdomen. Um, we're seeing the first yellow or the first segment all yellow, followed by that little W or two spots. Um, this one is a little bit more, the two spots are a little bit more clearly defined than they were in the photos we just looked at before. Um, again, a different angle. In, in this one, we can a little bit more clearly see that there is some um, yellow on the head and a little bit of yellow on the face, since the males in this species also have yellow on their face, which we can see in this photo as well. Um, so again, we're looking for, with big three, uh, photos of what's happening on the face and what's happening on those first two abdominal segments. 
But like I said, this species can be tricky, particularly for the, for the males. Um, while we're usually looking for that first segment being all yellow and then that little W or two spots, um, sometimes they can have um, additional um, segments of yellow towards the bottom of their abdomen. Uh, so this is a good example of a really tricky Bombus bimaculatus. Um, when you first look at this observation um, from this particular angle, it doesn't necessarily scream Bombus bimaculatus. We can tell that there's some yellow across that first segment, um, some on the second, but then further down on the abdomen as well. Um, so here we're more clearly seeing that classic Bombus bimaculatus pattern with the first segment yellow. There's our little W. Um, and then we've got sort of this yellowy looking tie dye pattern towards those um, lower abdominal segments. And this is just one of the variations that this species can have. Um, it, for, it's just one that can be a little bit trickier. Um, the, the two spots or the W shape sort of on that second um, abdominal segment is also a lot larger than the one that we just look at. So that yellow goes a little bit further or closer to the ends of the segment. Um, so getting all of these photos from these different angles um, is really helpful for us to be able to make sure we know, um, we can see what's going on and we can confirm that it for sure is a Bombus bimaculatus. And then our final species in the big three is Bombus griseocolis or the brown belted bumblebee. Again, a very, very common species. Um, it ranges across most of the US uh, with the exception kind of of the Southwestern states and it's found in most of Minnesota. Um, so again, similar to uh, the bi Bombus bimaculatus and Bombus impatiens, the Bombus griseocolis has mostly yellow going on on its thorax with just a little bit of black hairs in the middle. Um, I think the coloration or the yellow color of Bombus griseocolis is a little bit different. It's sort of a more like mustardy or richer yellow uh, than some of the other bees. Um, so from this first photo here, um, we aren't necessarily sure what's happening on the abdominal segments. We can see really, really clearly that there's lots of yellow, uh, but we need to look at the rest of the photos to determine um, what type of bee we're looking at. So from this side angle, um, we can kind of see a little bit what's going on. It looks like there's something on that, some yellow on that first abdominal segment, and then a little bit of brown on the second segment. Um, this photo cl really clearly shows the face. Um, one of the key determining factors for a Bombus griseocolis male um, are its really humongous eyes. The, the species, the males have ginormous eyes, which we can see really well in this picture and this picture as well. Um, they're taking up a lot of its head um, and then there's some yellow hairs um, in the middle of that face. And then this photo here, um, we can look at it a little bit more close up. Uh, we can more clearly see what's going on on the abdomen. So this is an example of a bee that's also sort of lost some hairs, um, but we can still see that there's yellow along that first abdominal segment, and then we have some brown. Um, so one of the distinguishing characteristics for Bombus griseocolis um, is this crescent shape of hairs that are usually brown. Sometimes they can be yellow. Um, they're pretty clearly brown in this photo, but uh, we can see that there are um, is sort of that crescent shape going on. And then just one more example of a brown belted or Bombus griseocolis male. Um, again, in this picture, it looks like this bee's got a lot of pollen all over him. Um, but we can see in this photo, we got some of that yellow on the first abdominal segment, um, followed by again, some more hairs on that second segment. These are also a little bit worn away, but what we're looking for is that sort of crescent shape of hairs that are mostly brown or um, maybe a little bit yellow. Again, looking at the face, this male has really, really ginormous eyes, um, a little bit of yellow on the face. And then again, uh, here is another angle uh, where we're looking at this bee from the side um, where we can see there's hairs on the first two segments. Um, the second segment has sort of that crescent shape of hairs. All right, so that's all for the big three. Um,
I think Jenny is up next. We can pass things on over to her. Great, thank you, Elise. All right, so to start off, I am gonna be talking about two of the mostly black bumblebees. The first one being Bombus pennsylvanicus or the American bumblebee. Um, so this first screen that you are all seeing is the summary screen for the species on Bumblebee Watch. And I just want to draw your attention to these two cartoons here of this species in the corner on the right-hand side. Um, so this is just a cartoon of the typical color pattern for this species. I'm just going to start off by walking you through that. So as Elaine mentioned, these are most more black bumblebees. They have more black hairs on their thorax compared to some of our big three bumblebee species. Um, they are typically yellow on the top of their thorax, but they may be all the way black um, on the rest of their thorax. Um, some morphs have more yellow hairs on the bottom of their thorax. It, it, there's just a lot of variation there. Um, for Bombus pennsylvanicus, they generally have a T1 segment, so that first segment on their abdomen, which has half black hairs, so black hairs at the top, and then a fringe of yellow hairs at the bottom. And then T1, or sorry, T2 is yellow, T3 is yellow, and then T4, 5, and 6 are black. The face of this bee has black hairs, uh, and then the top of the head or that vertex also will have black hairs. So if we look at the distribution of this species across the United States, it is pretty widespread, but we do have it in the Great Plains region. Um, it's present in southern Minnesota and southern North Dakota and then all across South Dakota as well. So if you're in any of those areas, it is a bee that you may encounter. So our first example of this bee species shows the, th the abdomen of the bee very well. We see each one of those abdominal segments. Um, I'm going to use the center of my, whoops, sorry about that. I'm gonna use the center of my pointer to just point out some of those features that I was talking about using that cartoon example. Um, so this is that first segment of the abdomen T1. And you can clearly see that the top of that segment has black hairs, but then there's this fringe at the bottom of yellow hairs. And this is a very important characteristic for this species. Um, one of the ways that we differentiate between Bombus pennsylvanicus and oricomus is by looking at the pattern of those hairs on the first segment of the abdomen. So if you encounter a, a bumblebee that's mostly black, spreading out those wings and getting a picture of those segments is super important for uh, a good ID. Uh, and then we can clearly see that T2 and T3 are yellow. Um, they're all yellow. And then the rest of the abdominal segments are black. We can also see that this is a female bee because as Elise was mentioning, uh, the shape of that hind leg segment there um, is triangular. And then there's very clearly a pollen load attached to that leg. From this angle, we can also see some of the thorax of the bee. Um, the back of it is black, and then we can kind of see the front of the thorax has some yellow hairs. Um, but to get a better look at that thorax, we'll need to look at another picture. Uh, so here is the same bee from a different angle, and I'm just going to zoom out here so that we can see the bee um, in its entirety, and I can use my pointer to point out some features of the bee. Um, so we see that the thorax here is mostly black at the back, and then we have yellow hairs at the front, so typical for Bombus pennsylvanicus. Uh, and then we can also see that the hairs on the top of the head and on the face are completely black. So if I zoom in here and you look in that photo on the right, uh, you can see that the top of the hair um, the top of the head, those hairs are completely black. And that's another key feature to look for for this species. You want to be able 
to see the vertex there because another way we differentiate this species from Oricomus is by looking for the presence of yellow hairs and there are no yellow hairs here. Um, we want to look at another example of Pennsylvanicus. This one is a little bit different than the, the bee that we just saw, um, mainly in that on the first segment of the abdomen, um, there are more yellow hairs. So we still see that fringe of yellow hairs on the bottom of that first segment of the abdomen, but we also see some yellow hairs going up through the middle there. And that is also another color pattern that Bombus pennsylvanicus will have, where they'll have more copious yellow hairs in the center of their uh, first segment of their abdomen. Um, but there's still black hairs on the sides at the top of that segment. Uh, we can clearly see that T2 and T3 are completely yellow and that the remaining hairs on the abdomen are black um, on T4, 5, and 6. Um, from this angle, we can also see that the thorax is mostly black on this bee as well, with yellow hairs towards the front. Looking at this bee from another angle, we can see that the hairs on the face are completely black, so that vertex is completely black, and then the hairs on the front of the face are completely black as well. Um, this photograph also shows the three simple eyes that the bee has in the top of its head. So I'm just gonna point, those are right in the middle there um, in between the two main eyes. Um, and for Pennsylvanicus, those eyes are typically smaller than in Oricomus. Um, so when you're taking pictures of the face, getting a photograph of that feature can also be helpful as well. All right, I'm going to move on to Oricomus. All right, so this is the summary page for Oricomus on Bumblebee Watch, the black and gold bumblebee. Uh, this bee looks very similar to Bombus pennsylvanicus. It is also a mostly black bumblebee. Um, it has mostly black hairs on T1, and it has yellow hairs on T2 and 3, and then black hairs on T4, 5, and 6 very similar to Bombus pennsylvanicus. It has mostly black hairs on the thorax. Um, it also has some yellow hairs towards the front of the thorax, and it will often have a fringe of yellow hairs on the back. And once again, there's a ton of variation there. Some oricomus bees will have a lot of yellow hairs, some will have less. Um, it just depends on the individual that you're looking at. Um, Two key things to look for to differentiate this bee from Pennsylvanicus is that those hairs on the top of the head, as I mentioned, Oricomus has, tends to have yellow hairs. Uh, some individuals will have a ton of yellow hairs on the top of their head. Some will just have one or two hairs. Uh, there's a ton of variation there. Um, and then the second thing to look for is the patterning of the hairs on T2, or sorry, T1 of the abdomen. Um, some Bombus oricomus will have completely black T1. Um, some of them will have yellow hairs on the sides of T1. So on either side of, of that first segment, there will be yellow hairs. But as you move into the middle, there will be fewer yellow hairs. Um, and we'll see some examples of that um, as we move on to the observations. The range of this species is very similar to Pennsylvanicus. Um, it's slightly less widespread, um, but still is present in Southern Minnesota, North Dakota and South Dakota. So if you're in any of these areas, this is a species that you might run into. All right, so here is our first example of a Bombus oricomus. Uh, just gonna zoom in on that first abdominal segment, just to show you guys that how uh, the pattern of this bee typically looks. Um, so this bee has all black hairs on T1. Um, on T2, uh, yellow hairs. There is some darkness on the top half of T2 here. That's mostly the cuticle of the bee. So underneath the bee's hairs, it's all black. Um, so you can kind of see the cuticle, that, that little shiny area right there. Um, but some black hairs extending 
a little bit on the two T2. Uh, and then uh, T3 is completely yellow and we can't see the other segments of the abdomen too well from this photograph, but they are rest they are black um, the rest of the way down. The thorax of the bee is once again, mostly black. We do have a strip of yellow hair here towards the front, very typical for the species. And then we can also see that vertex here with yellow hairs. If we move to another photo, we can see um, some of the features of the bee that we didn't quite spot before. Um, if you look in on the zoomed in area of the bee's head, you can see how it has copious yellow hairs on the vertex there, um, very typical for oricomus. Um, so just zooming out here, right, we can see in the smaller version of the picture, those yellow hairs, and in the bigger big version of this picture, there are lots of yellow hairs there. Um, we can also see that this is a female bee from the shape of the hind leg, right? That's very triangular looking. That's a great place to put pollen if you're a female bee. Ah. Another example of oricomus, this one has more yellow hairs on the back of the thorax. So unlike those previous two examples, or the, the previous example that had mostly dark hairs, um, we see some lighter hairs here, and that is something that you'll see for this species as well. Uh, once again, we see the light hairs on the vertex of the bee, um, ni a nice little triangle of yellow hairs. Some people think of those as like the eyebrows of the bee, um, because from some angles, it almost looks like they have a little set of yellow eyebrows. Um, and then once again, we see that T1 is completely black. Um, oh, actually, sorry, T1 is not completely black. This is actually an example that has uh, some yellow hairs on the sides of T1. So right here are some yellow hairs on T1. But as we move in towards the center of T1, the yellow hairs become more sparse and the center of that segment is quite dark. Um, so very typical for Bombus orcomus. Uh, one thing I would like to point out is that for some Bombus orcomus, the yellow hairs on the vertex are very sparse. So this is one example where the hairs on the top of the head are almost completely dark. There maybe is a couple hairs that are yellow, um, but really it's genuinely just a, a one or two hairs. Um, but we can tell that this is an oricomus because of the hair pattern on T1, right? We have a fringe of yellow hairs on the sides, but as we move towards the center of that segment, it becomes darker. So the center, of T1 is mostly dark. And for Pennsylvanicus, you're gonna see a strip of yellow hairs going all the way through, or you might see some yellow hairs extending towards the top of that first segment of the abdomen. And before I move on to my next set of bees I wanted to talk about, I have a little quiz for you all. So I'd like to hear from you, the audience, what bee species you think that this bee is. Um, if you have an answer, please post it to the chat as opposed to the Q&A, um, just because we don't want to bog the Q&A down with responses to this. So I'll give you guys a little while to think about it, uh, and then please put your answer in the chat. Well, it appears as if the chat is actually disabled. Oh, so no. <laughs> I hope you all made a wonderful guess on your own. Sorry about that, everyone. Oh, 
I'm sorry that I can't see your answers. I hope that most of you said Pennsylvanicus um, because this bee is a Pennsylvanicus. Um, if we look at that T1, we can see that there is a fringe of yellow hairs at the bottom and they go across that first segment almost in a straight line. Very typical for Pennsylvanicus. We can't see the top of the head here, um, but if we could, we would look for those black hairs on the top of the head to signify to us that it's Pennsylvanicus. So once again, just showcasing how important it is to get a photograph of this bee with its wings spread out so that we can really see the pattern there on the first segment of its abdomen. All right. So the next bee species I'm going to talk about is Bombus citrinus. It's one of the more common cuckoo bumblebees in the Midwestern United States. It's one you may run into, especially if you're in Minnesota. Um, there are lots of different species of cuckoo bumblebees. Uh, this is just one of them. Um, but cuckoo bumblebees have a parasitic lifestyle. So they invade the colonies of non-cuckoo bumblebee species and then take over the colony. Um, and they trick the workers of that other colony to raise their brood for them. And so you actually won't ever see a worker cuckoo bumblebee. You'll only ever see queens and males. Um, so I'm going to start off by talking about what the queens or the female cuckoo bumblebees look like. The lemon cuckoo bumblebee has a mostly yellow thorax. Um, Sometimes, or, you know, typically you'll see a little little dot of black in the center of the thorax between the two wings, but that's not displayed here. Um, there are copious yellow hairs on the vertex of the head, and they may have some yellow hairs on the front of the face, although they can also have hairs on the front of the face that are black. Um, and then there's lots of variation in the coloration of the abdomen for cuckoo bumblebees. So some of them may be more yellow. They'll have yellow on T1 and T2. Um, and then um, they will often have a stripe of yellow on T3, although sometimes you'll see darker morphs, which will have no yellow on T1 or T2, or, you know, almost no yellow hairs on T3 even, and they'll just be completely black all the way down. Um, but T4 and T5 uh, and T6 will have black hairs. Um, cuckoo bumblebees also have some characteristics that separate them from non-cuckoo bumblebees. Um, and the lemon cuckoo bumblebee also displays these characteristics. So one of those is that the cuckoo bumblebees don't have pollen baskets. They don't carry pollen with them because they uh, parasitize colonies of other bumblebees, which do all of that pollen collection for them. Uh, and you can't quite see it here in this picture, but that leg, that hind leg has no structures on it for carrying pollen. Um, cuckoo bumblebees also tend to have really curved abdomens uh, and they also tend to have really thick heads. And so those are some things that I'm gonna be pointing out as I move through um, my examples for the cuckoo bumblebee. Uh, just to show you guys a range map of where this bee is present. Oops. Um, present in Appalachia and the Appalachian Mountains. It's also present in the East and in the Midwest through the North. Uh, historically, its range has extended down into Missouri and Nebraska, but we haven't had any bumblebee watch participants encounter any cuckoo bumblebees down there yet, um, but hopefully we will someday. Um, and yeah, so if you're in the Northern Midwest, you may encounter this bee species. So in our first example of a lemon cuckoo bumblebee, we can see the thorax of the bee is mostly yellow. Uh, and then in this example, the this bee has quite a quite dark abdomen. Uh, so if we zoom in here, uh, we see that the hairs on the thorax are almost completely yellow. There's a little dot of black right there in between the two wing joints. Um, and then there are some yellow hairs on T1 and it looks like maybe T2. Um, but then we see that there are 
uh, some yellow hairs on T3, mostly concentrated on the sides. And for cuckoo bumblebees, or for the lemon cuckoo bumblebee in particular, generally the yellow hairs are going to be concentrated on T3. For other cuckoo bumblebees, those yellow hairs uh, tend to be concentrated on T4. So just some or just something to keep in mind when you are photographing these species. It's important to, to take a photograph so that we can see where the yellow hairs are concentrated. Um, we can also see that there are yellow hairs on the top of the head uh, and that her head is pretty big, right? So very typical for cuckoo bumblebee. Uh, and then we can also see that she does not have a structure on her leg that allows her to carry pollen. And if I zoom in here and you look at the uh, larger image on the screen, you can really see that, that there are hairs all the way through that middle segment on the hind leg, right? There's no place to put pollen there. Just this bee from another angle, we can see, you know, that little dot of black in the center of the thorax. And once again, those copious yellow hairs on the vertex and, or on the top of the head. Um, for these next two examples, I'm just going to show you photographs of the bee as opposed to showing you an observation. Um, so this is another cuckoo, lemon cuckoo bumblebee. Uh, and we can really see here that this one has more yellow hairs on T3 than the last example. Uh, so no yellow hairs on T1, T2, but concentration of yellow hairs on T3. Um, once again, mostly yellow hairs on the thorax and then a uh, copious yellow hairs on the vertex or on the top of the head. Last example here, this bee is really dark, uh, lemon cuckoo bumblebee. So we've got light hairs on the thorax. She is all yellow except for a little dot in between the two wing joints. Um, but if we look at her abdomen, um, we can see that it is mostly dark. So some Cuckoo bumblebees look like this. They are very, very dark. Um, uh, from this angle, we can also see the leg of the bee that there are, there's no shiny area that's lacks hairs for her to load pollen. And there's some pollen on her leg, but that's probably just residual pollen from visiting flowers and collecting nectar. Um, this isn't a great photo to see this, but you can kind of see how the abdomen curves a bit here. Let's see if we can see it in another picture. In this other picture, you can see too a little bit of that curve of the abdomen, which is something that signifies that this could be a cuckoo bumblebee. All right, and I don't think I have time to go through citrinus males, so I'm going to hand it off to you, Katie. Okay, so I'm going to talk about some of the orange banded bumblebees. Um, and I'm going to do this in a split screen so we can kind of do them comparatively because a lot of these species look very similar. Um, luckily, depending on where you are, not all of them overlap, which can be really helpful. So the first thing when you catch an orange banded bumblebee is to take into account your map and or your location where you're based. So on the left-hand side here, I have Hunt's bumblebee, and on the right, we have the tricolored bumblebee or Ternarius. So scrolling down to their maps to give you an idea of where both of these are based. Um, on the left, Huntia is more of a Western species and Ternarius is more of a North slash Eastern species. So, you know, if you're in Nebraska, you're gonna run into Huntia a lot more frequently than you might with Ternarius. And same with Minnesota, you're likely to hit Ternarius more than you are Huntii. But while these maps can sort of help us decipher, it's always good to look at the features of the actual bee because distributions can change. Sometimes we get rare occurrences. So taking into account maps and ID features is a good idea with some of these lookalikes. So the main difference between these two um, if we look at the, the images here, is the rear end of the thorax. So on Huntii, where my pointer is, we're going to see a nice 
clean strip of yellow here with no black hairs mixed in. But on Ternarius, we're going to see this little black notch here. There's going to be a division between that nice bar of yellow where we're going to see black hairs. There's going to look like a break in that yellow band. But aside from that, these bees can look very similar. Um, another difference for Ternarius sometimes is that they'll have more black hairs mixed in on their face or at the top of the thorax here, but not always. So if we look at a few pictures, we've got them side by side here. So here in this first, there's a nice one, looking at the thorax here of Ternarius, we can see that there is a break in the yellow hairs here on the rear end of the thorax. Whereas with this hunty eye photo, if you look where my plus sign is on the box there, it looks like just a nice yellow strip. We don't see any black hairs mixed in there. Um, then we can also look at the face of these bees. So while I can see that there are black hairs on this bee's face, it is predominantly yellow, right? Hunty I can have a few black hairs on their face, but predominantly it's going to be yellow there. Whereas when we look at this bee's face over here, the tricolored bumblebee, there are yellow hairs, but it's predominantly black. So that can be a good differentiation too, is looking at what color is seen um, in a more predominant fashion there on the face and again on the top of the thorax. This one, oops has a few black hairs mixed in here, but not a whole lot. So the biggest thing for tricolored is this notch. And then looking at the colors of the hair on the face, we can look at a few more pictures to get some different images in our brain of them. Again, we see a nice notch here, the rear of the thorax for Ternarius or the tricolored bumblebee. You can see in that top band of yellow, there are a few black hairs mixed in. And while the face is out of focus, we can see that it's predominantly black. And then when we look here over at Hunty Eye, looking through these images, it doesn't seem to be a break or a notch of black in this section of the thorax. Um, the hair color, while there are black hairs, is more yellow than it is black. Um, but aside from that, both of these bees, when you look at their abdomen, are going to be very similar. The first segment is yellow, the second and third segments are orange, and then the fourth segment is yellow. So in that sense, these species are pretty consistent with that color pattern. So we're looking at the variation between that notch in the thorax and the coloration on the face. Okay, and then I'm going to bring up Bifarius and compare that one with Huntii. This species uh, is more of a western montane species. We'll bring up the map of Huntii again. So if you're in western Nebraska, you could encounter this one. It shows up a lot in the Black Hills area of South Dakota. We haven't seen any in North Dakota yet, but there have been some observations in northern Minnesota. Um, for most of the observations that we get from South Dakota, they tend to be this orange variation. I haven't seen any of the black yet, um, but this species can have a lot of variation. So when we pull up the Guide to Bumblebees of Western North America, which is a nice PDF online if you want an alternative resource, it shows most of the color patterns that we see pretty commonly. And the two-form bumblebee uh, gets its name because it can have two forms, right? You can see there's this black form of it and the orange form. So mostly in South Dakota, what I've been seeing is this form right here. Very yellow with a little black notch similar to Tumerius. Um, And then on T2, it has a little bit of black hairs sort of in a triangular pattern or yellow hairs there. And then it also is going to have these little tiny tufts of yellow hairs down at the base of T5. So as we look through pictures of these, 
Um, pull up a hunty eye for comparison. You can see this one, we can't really see black hairs in there. There might be a little bit of a notch, but if I was only going off of this photo, I would have a really hard time determining what it was. So luckily this person took a photo of the abdomen. So if I can get out my pointer here, I'm looking right at this part. So this is the top of T2 here. So here's T1, T2, T3, T4, and then five and six are out of focus here. So in this triangle, at the top of T2, you can see there's a little bit of yellow hairs dipping down into that segment. And that's not something that we would see on Huntii or Ternarius. Um, so if I see that photo, it leads me to think it's a different species. Let me clear these out. And then the other thing is these little tufts. So these tufts aren't always here. But in most of the observations that have come in from the Black Hills, they tend to be there. So right in this area on, oops, sorry about that. On this area right here, this is T5. This is the little tiny tuft of yellow hair that I'm looking at. Um, so here again, we have T1 yellow. Oh my gosh, lost my pointer. T2 is orange, T3 is orange. T4 is yellow, T5 is black, but it has the little tuft of yellow there. So that is a good feature that can go in combination with those yellow hairs on T2 and the notch on the thorax. So it's sort of like process of elimination of what am I not seeing or what am I seeing to sort of make these species determinations. Um, another cool, or I guess different character about this bee, let me get my mouse back is the color of the corbicular fringe. So on the pollen basket here, you can see these hairs coming off the side, which are kind of like the walls of the pollen basket. They help to keep the pollen in that area while the bees flying around. They are actually orange. And on both the tricolored bumblebee and Hunt's bumblebee, those hairs are gonna be black, but Bombus bifarius or this two-form bumblebee has orange hairs on the corbicular fringe. Um, another character for this bee is that it tends to have orange tarsi or orange toes, if you will. And this, this can be altered a little bit by the lighting a lot of times, but compared to other species of bees, these little tarsi or toes are a lot brighter orange than many other species. So if we look at a picture of, let's pull up Huntii here. Zoom in, you can see, even though it is out of focus, you can see that this bee's pollen basket has black hairs around it. And the tarsi are pretty dark colored. So if you are in an area where the two-form bumblebee exists, you find a bee that has orange-looking toes, um, those patches of yellow on T5, some yellow or black hairs dipping down. Here's a nice picture of it. Dipping down into T2. Um, all of those characters are good for Bombus bifarius. Okay, and then one more species, Bombus rufocinctus. This one I'm just going to make into a big screen. So this is, as Elaine said, an extremely variable bee. Um, this one really is process of elimination. It's not this species. It's not that species. It's not this species. Okay, it's got to be rufocinctus. That's kind of what it comes down to sometimes. Um, here is the map. So it's in... All of the states that we're focusing on today, Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska. Um, and here again is the guide to Western bumblebees. And you can see that there is a lot of variation just within the species between queens, between workers, between males. 
Um, and this definitely isn't all of the color patterns that exist, right? These are just some of the more common ones that have been recognized. So uh, the biggest thing with this species, in my opinion, is the cheek link. So like Elaine was talking about earlier between Bombus vegans and Sandersoni is looking at those cheek lengths. And Rufocinctus has a very, very short cheek, has a very round looking face because of that. So I have a couple pulled up here. Okay, so on the left hand side is Rufocinctus. So again, we're looking from the base of the eye to where the mandible attaches and how that distance compares um, between the two. So that would be a short cheek to be here. This is Bombus rufocinctus, has more of a rounder face versus on the left-hand side, we have one of the long-cheeked bees. I believe this was Bombus borealis. So again, looking at the distance between the eye and the mandible, it's a lot longer, right? So this is a long-cheeked bee versus the short-cheeked bee. And Rufocinctus has one of the long, I'm uh, sorry, shortest cheeks that you'll see. Uh, it's really evident on males because their eyes are so enlarged that the cheek length, it just doesn't even look like there is a cheek on the bee. So short cheek, um, another character with these, which can vary even within itself is looking at the second tergite. So the second abdominal segment, it often has some sort of a yellow crescent on it. I can get my drawing out again. So here we are on T2 right here. This yellow crescent doesn't take up the entire segment, right? So this line is the base of the segment. Let's say this is the top. So this yellow part right here, the red belted bumblebees usually have some amount of yellow on the top part of that second segment. Sometimes the yellow can go all the way across um, sometimes it might be just restricted to the central portion of that segment, but there's usually some kind of yellow on the top part of T2. Let me put some other pictures of this species. All right, so here again, if we zoom in, again, not super in focus on the abdomen, but you can kind of see that it does have yellow. I'm gonna use the plus sign in the middle of the feature here as my pointer for a second. But right about here, we can see that there's a yellow crescent within T2. So there's orange and yellow on the same segment. Um, <clears throat> this one wants to load. There's another nice picture of the cheek. And this one is of the black variation, right? So we see some yellow on T2. Nice photo of the face. Oh, nice photo of the face showing that short cheek length again. Um, and this picture actually shows two queens. We thought they were queens anyway because of the time of year and their size. Collected at the same place, um, but both very different color patterns. So Again, the species can vary a lot visually, so it's important to get a nice picture of the face so we can see that cheek length. Um, and we can also assess the ocelli or those simple eyes that Elaine was talking about earlier on the species. Um, and then as well as parting the wings to see what the pattern is on the abdomen can also be helpful. I pulled up a couple pictures of males as well, just to show their eyes. But you can see these eyes relative to the females are sort of bulgy and buggy. I think there's a nicer one. That's not the one show. Yeah, right here. So these eyeballs are huge and it looks like there's almost no cheek, um, just really big and bulbous. And when you see these kind of large eyes, it really minimizes the amount of species that you could have collected, right? So Bombus griseocolis or the brown-belted bumblebee has these large eyes. 
There's a couple other species, but depending on where you are in the U.S., it's going to limit your possibilities. So if you find these big eyes, that can be a helpful feature for narrowing down your options. Um, the males here, this one's pretty faded. You can kind of see there used to be orange on there. Um, but as time goes on, the bees do wear out. Some of them lose hairs. The colors can fade. So that can get a little bit tricky. But again, getting a nice photo of the face like this helps us determine what species we're looking at. And I think that's all I've got. Now is a great time to answer some questions. Katie, I think there are some you marked that you wanted to answer live. Yeah, there were a couple that came in about iNaturalist, um, which is a common question. So for those of you that are not participating in the Bumblebee Atlas, um, Bumblebee Watch is essentially like eBird or a mini iNaturalist where we're only collecting observations of bumblebees throughout the US and Canada. And we use that website instead of iNaturalist because it allows us to gather survey data. So when volunteers go out and do a survey for the Bumblebee Atlas, they're collecting more than just the bumblebees they find, right? They're doing a, a quick habitat assessment to say what flowers are in the area, what nesting resources are in the area. So it allows us to gather more data than just a simple observation of a bee species at a point in time. Um, all of the observations like Jenny noted earlier, are verified by an expert. So the four of us here on this call spend a lot of time going through each observation rather than crowdsourcing the observation. So if you're just you know out on a walk and you see a bumblebee, iNaturalist is a great place to just upload that incidental observation. But for effort-based surveys and monitoring, Bumblebee Watch allows us to capture more of that data. And in the larger database of bumblebees of North America, um, iNaturalist data is incorporated, so you definitely don't need to upload your observations to both sites. Um, yeah, hopefully that answered those questions. I see a question regarding lemon cuckoo bumblebees. Um, are these bumblebee is still beneficial in some way, even though they are parasitic. Um, and I think parasitic is a little bit of a loaded word, right? We associate parasites as being negative. Um, they're negative when we have them <laughs> as humans, for sure. Um, but just because they parasitize other bumblebee species, they're still ecologically valuable. Um, they contribute to the diversity of our planet. Um, and so and I, I believe inherently they have value just in and of themselves. Um, they are still bumblebees and they do still visit flowers to collect nectar. The males will be on flowers as well. And when they're moving between flower to flower, they are still providing pollination services. Um, so in that way, they are also uh, providing an ecosystem service too. And just to mention, some of our bumblebees that are at highest risk of extinction belong to this group of cuckoo bumblebees. So they're definitely of conservation concern. Um, so Trinus seems to be doing okay, but there's um, other ones that I've never gotten to a chance chance to see during my you know 25 years of looking for bumblebees because they're so rare, even though they used to be um, around this area. So um, so yeah, they're 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 very special. Um, Katie, we had a question about the alternative guide uh, to bumblebees that you referenced during your portion of the presentation, and I think I dropped the correct link in there, but would you mind checking that? Was it in the chat? Uh, it's in the Q&A. Q&A. Yeah, I can't remember who produced those, if it was Forest Service. Elaine, do you remember? Was it USDA Forest Service? Yeah, yeah. Now, I wasn't sure which ones that was referring to. Yeah, there's yeah. those four service guides, the, the Western and the Eastern ones. Yeah, if you just type into Google bumblebees of Western United States or bumblebees of Eastern United States, they should both pop up pretty quickly. Um, 
but we can certainly send around a link to those when we send out the recording, if that would be helpful. I can't find the question in here. I'm sorry. I had already <laughs> answered it. That's my bad. I did drop the the bumblebees of the Western United States okay. guide, which I think is yeah. specifically the one you referenced. But yeah, if you're in Minnesota or the Dakotas or Nebraska, probably the one to the Eastern United States would also be helpful. Um, there's a question about where to find instructions on how to capture cool and photograph the bees. So a lot of the images that we went over today were from participants that are helping out with the Bumblebee Atlas. So there's um, trainings that happen in spring that are also posted online. There's a participant handbook that shows all the protocol and how to get involved. Um, and you can find those for whichever state you're located in by going to bumblebeeatlas.org. Um, does one of you three want to answer the question about the Athenus Twin Cities? Sure, I'll just make sure I'm reading it <laughs> <laughs> correctly. Um, right. Um, so, so yeah, the the um, with areas where we have presence of um, high likelihood of finding rusty patch bumblebees we're not able to do that capturing and cooling or we're, we you're only we only recommend people do that if they are covered by a recovery permit from the u.s fish and wildlife service um, because there is um there is some slight risk to, to bumblebees whenever you you're capturing them and handling them and so just in light of reducing all risk and not having people be liable for potential harm to to an endangered species we um recommend that people do not capture and hunt and handle bumblebees in areas that um where rusty patch bumblebee have been recently documented so we do have some volunteers then that um, we're still interested in what's happening with bumblebees here so um we do coordinate among people that have permits to continue to do surveys in these areas so we do still have um records using the same methods from people who are who are covered um, by these recovery permits and able to handle the bumblebees. Um, but we do have some volunteers that do continue to just do photo surveys. And so, um, so yeah, live there, other people are are better at doing this, this live um, bumblebee picture taking than, than I am. It, it is definitely tricky. Um, one of the key things is um, being is, is taking more photos than you'll think you, you'll need. Um, you know, you're, you're dealing with the wind blowing the flowers, um, bees getting out of focus. It can be, you know, we do still um, you know if the if these are going to be incidental surveys or 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 um you know trying to get an idea of what's going on with them it, it can be trickier to to make sure you're just taking pictures of one bumblebee as bees fly off and come in and there may be some a couple of bumblebees going around on a flower but it is really important when we're looking at these bees and identifying them that we have one individual because these are forming a record where we're expecting it to be one individual so um yeah, I mean, you know, finding fl fl patches of flowers that are in good light when you can. Um, I just use point and shoot photos, I, not cameras. Um, I know other people will will use, you know, fancier cameras. I don't know if if um, if any of us here. I know some of our volunteers are probably <laughs> the best people to, to answer this because so, there's some of them that are are amazing photographers um, doing this much better than me. Yeah, yeah. I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, if you go on the, I don't know if it's on the Minnesota page, but definitely on the Nebraska and Missouri Bumblebee Atlas website, there is a photo tips section where one of the amazing volunteers from the Pacific Northwest, uh, who used to be a professional photographer, has laid out all of the steps and how he takes his photos and what equipment he uses. So if that's your thing, um, there is information available. 
One thing I also will do sometimes if I've tried to take some photos of a bee already and I just can't quite get it, a good angle of it is to just take a video of it and then go back and take screenshots of the video that show the different angles that I need to do a positive ID. So, you know, as it's flying, sometimes you can capture an image of the bee with its wings spread out and then you can get different angles of the face. Um, it it just it depends on how I usually use my phone to take videos like that and the quality of the imagery from those really depends on what equipment you're using um so sometimes videos can be a little bit blurry or, like they're not like compared to using a high quality camera your photos are not going to be as high quality from taking stills of a video but it can if you're not as comfortable using photography equipment um, then the video might work out better for you. Um, and I think the person who asked that question originally takes very good photos of bees um, on flowers. So, um, you know, you're already very skilled and I wouldn't, you're already all the way there, I would say, for taking, like, I'm sure that you have better tips than we do <laughs> for taking photos of bees on flowers. Um, but for those who are, are, you know, less comfortable, the video can really help out. Um, Kathy asked about the value of the data we are providing when doing surveys in grids that are most needed. Um, feel free to chime in here if I miss anything, but generally when we have an ask of like, hey, we need help in these grid cells, it's for a few different reasons. Um, one of those is that there's just very little data. It's typically a rural part of the state. Not a lot of people live out there. It can be hard to get to. Maybe there's not a lot of easy surveyed easy places to survey out there, you know, if it's mainly agricultural land. Um, it's just an area that we really would like to learn more about what's happening there in the way of bumblebees. What species are there? What plants are they using? What kind of habitats are they found in? To just sort of fill in an information gap that currently exists. So if you are able to go out to what we typically label as like a priority grid, or it's of a different color on the grid maps, that can be very helpful because you're putting a point on the map that hasn't existed before or hasn't existed in 20 years or so. Um, anything else about doing surveys and priority grids that you all would like to add? I think you covered it, Katie. Um, just a reminder for everybody, we are past 1.30, so if you need to hop off of the um, Zoom, you are free to do so. If you would like to hang out and ask more questions, um, we'll be on for a little while um, until your questions are answered. Um, to So we have a question regarding the Iowa Atlas. If you are part of a county conservation ag agency, can you participate in this study for another way to use the data to assist county properties for future habitat improvements? Um, yeah, so we're super excited about the launch of the Iowa Atlas that's going to happen next year. Um, and we welcome folks from all agencies to participate in this program. Um, you know, we're, we're, we would be so glad to have you on board. Um, you know, we, it will take us a while to collect data in Iowa, but once we have sufficient data collected, that will be the point in which we will move on to making habitat recommendations. Um, so we are a ways off from making re recommendations for improvements, but if you're more interested in monitoring what species are present on county properties or something like that, um, then definitely, you know, that information will be available, you know, as soon as those species are verified. You can go look on the uh, Atlas website and or on the Bumblebee Watch website and see that map of observations um, as long as they are publicly available. Um, so, you know, if you're interested in specific monitoring specific species on specific properties, um, 
that would be a participating in this project would be a great way to to do that. Uh, and then later on, we will have some information on you know plant recommendations, seed recommendations, and that sort of thing.